For a disciple of Jesus Christ, academic scholarship is a form of worship. Elder Neil A. Maxwell. President Hinckley gave me the charge to help BYU be the best it could be. And it was with that understanding that uh, he and the brethren approved the naming of the Maxwell Institute, both to honor Neil Maxwell for the tremendous contributions he had made to not only the church and to BYU, but also to highlight the uh, uh, intent that we would be broadening and that uh, we would be uh, uh, seeking academic excellence as we think about Neil Maxwell and his, his role as our progenitor there. I think sometimes we've had the tendency to think that uh, because uh, we're so poorly understood, we don't have a responsibility to understand them. And I think Elder Maxwell was one uh, who, who understood that uh, innately and intuitively and, and maybe from the very beginning. And because uh, he was such a good listener, then when he spoke, he was listened to. And uh, I think that that is uh, an important thing for us all to try to do at the Maxwell Institute. This link may not be obvious to everyone that research sort of in esoteric sources has any bearing on our faith, you know, our, our devotion, our commitment to the gospel. But the scriptures seem to point in the other direction that there actually is a link. One of my favorites and one of Joseph's favorites, because he quoted it a number of times, uh, is one in this 88th section where it says, as all have not faith, seek ye diligently, and teach one another words of wisdom. Yea, seek ye out of the best books words of wisdom. Seek learning even by study and also by faith. That's an interesting scripture because it assumes that there will be people in the church who do not have faith, who are struggling with their faith, and that the remedy for their ailments is to study, to seek out of the best books, and to teach one another. We should be as fearless as those who have gone before us in each generation of the church and reach out to wider and wider audiences. Those conversations, to be meaningful, have to be rigorous, accurate, candid, and, and that those are values for scholarship, and they're not antithetical to the values we have as Latter-day Saints will have the most personal fulfillment if we try to blend our discipleship with our scholarship. And I think that gives role models um, to current LDS scholars, but also to the youth of the church who may not understand how to negotiate the competing challenges of being a professional and being a faithful believer. I think for me, as I've come to better understand how we as Mormons read the Bible, by examining how other people read the Bible, it helps me uh, feel like my own understanding is more rooted because um, it's not just based on assumptions, but um, on comparison. And that's really the basis of all religious studies. I think that, that we're sometimes dismissive of outsiders, and then, and then we're offended when people are dismissive of, of us. And, and this is a game that doesn't have winners, right? This, there are ways of, of talking with people where you take their faith seriously, and in turn, your faith can be taken seriously. Well, I think it's significant that uh, Joseph Smith himself used language in the Doctrine and Covenants that indicated he saw the Restoration as a, as, as a broad, recuperative effort to uh, assimilate and incorporate the best and most inspired thinking going on not just within the Mormon community, but outside of the Mormon tradition. Uh, he makes reference in the Doctrine and Covenants to holy men that ye know not of. There are references in the Book of Mormon to other scriptures written by other peoples in other times and places. References in the Doctrine and Covenants to scripture being a much broader, more inclusive category that includes the inspired words of anybody who speaks under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, God has spoken many times in many places in many languages, so it helps us realize that it's not up to us to determine uh, to whom or how God speaks to his people, you know? I mean, we, we encounter it. And the very best texts for dealing with the depths of human life are religious texts. The Maxwell Institute is particularly committed to uh, engagement with sacred texts because I think in the effort to understand the sacred texts of this world, and to understand the way people have read those and tried to 
appreciate uh, and appropriate them in their own lives. That's really where we come to understand a person's faith experience. With the growth of interest in religious studies in the academy, the Mormon Studies Review seeks to encourage scholars, both LDS and non-LDS, as well as interested non-specialists, in the broad conversations about Mormonism going on in the academic world. I believe there are things that we cannot appreciate about Mormonism because we're simply too close to it. That happens in every other area of our lives. Why would it not happen here? So at the very least, the Academy gives us the benefit of that perspective which illuminates what we can't see because we're too close to it. The Mormon Studies Journal is a fabulous opportunity to begin conversations around some of these issues. And conversations, uh, I think, among people who might not otherwise talk to one another. We get to make the kinds of connections, have that kind of cross-pollination of ideas and personalities and interactions that, that helps break down misunderstanding and stereotypical kinds of statements. I had lots of, uh, especially at Carolina, lots of evangelical students who came in knowing that they didn't like Mormons and just wanting ammunition to figure out why. The best example I have of this is a student who at the last day when she handed in her exam to me, she gave me her exam and she thanked me and she said, I just, I just want you to know how grateful I am for this course because not only do I feel like I learned a, a lot about Mormons and I don't have a hatred the way that I used to, but I also learned a lot about my own tradition as a result. The Lord relies on us to find a way to reach His children in every generation. And that means recreating our language and our approach every generation. And I think the Maxwell Institute is, is right here and perfectly positioned to midwife these new voices out into the world. I'm convinced that it's um, going to revitalize um, the, the lived experience of Mormonism for many of our young people. I think there's a lot more to be done in, in looking at Mormonism and Mormon scripture within the context of American religious history. But I think, I think looking at Mormonism in the context of, of world religions is, a, is, is the, a place that we, we want to go in the future. Uh, the Middle Eastern Text Initiative at the Maxwell Institute is one example of putting into concrete action this expansive vision where we say there are many texts, many words that have been written through the centuries by men and women inspired of God. The Maxwell Institute is in many ways at the forefront of, uh, of restoring to its central place this kind of broad-mindedness that Mormonism originally embodied. There was a time in the Middle East when Jews, Christians, and Muslims came together with mutual respect to seek wisdom out of each other's books. The Middle Eastern Texts Initiative publishes bilingual editions of intellectual and spiritual masterpieces from these traditions, with the goal of better understanding other faiths as well as our own. The Islamic Translation Series um, is constructed to bring Jewish, Christian, and Muslim authors from antiquity back into dialogue with each other because they were in dialogue with each other in the first place. What uh, BYU is doing in the Maxwell Institute in the Library of Judeo-Arabic Literature, and really the series in general, is an amazing achievement. And it, it really is uh, wonderful to make uh, the classics of these traditions available in beautiful volumes and facing page editions that uh, make the Arabic texts available immediately to Arabists, uh, but also uh, with English translations that make them accessible to anyone. It's not merely providing people like myself with the Arabic, but it's providing people who have no Arabic with maybe their first sort of insight into this vast richness that is Islamic culture and how much we can learn. We can learn. We can learn about ourselves that, oh my goodness, I've been making all these presuppositions. I just thought they were obvious, and they're not. These are the sort of uh, transformative events that can shift uh, the conversation in really important ways. There's a scripture in, in the Book of Mormon that I love in Alma. Alma's talking to Helaman and he says, we're, we're, we're preserving these records because they've enlarged the memory of this people. I see the Middle Eastern Text Initiative as doing something very similar. It's enlarging our cultural memory and understanding by bringing texts that were forgotten or lost back into circulation. I've studied the Quran, you know, that's my, been my, 
My, uh, my graduate studies were in Islamic studies, and so I studied the Quran for years and years and years. And it's, it is a text that's taken seriously in the world in religious studies. I think the Book of Mormon is every bit as rich and deep and can contribute to the conversations as the Quran or any other sacred text out there. There is so much more in the Book of Mormon than we have yet discovered. The book's divine architecture and rich furnishings will increasingly unfold to our view, further qualifying it as a marvelous work and a wonder. The Laura F. Willis Center for Book of Mormon Studies sponsors research and publications on the historical, literary, and theological aspects of the Book of Mormon. Its intent is to broaden appreciation and understanding of the Book of Mormon as one of the world's great sacred texts and as another testament of Jesus Christ. Guided by the highest standards of academic inquiry, the Willis Center's approach to the Book of Mormon is anchored in the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. The very founding documents of the Willis Center talk about the Willis Center getting the Book of Mormon out there uh, in a bigger way than, than you could ever do it without the resources and support that something like the Willis Center can do. I think what we're seeing is a broadening of the field of Book of Mormon studies, away from just trying to, to prove it true, but we're actually, in a sense, trying to prove it interesting and make it more accessible to the, the broader field of, of religious studies. I was talking with a, um, with a Pentecostal scholar a, a month ago or so. He was very interested in the Book of Mormon. He actually wants to write a little bit about the Book of Mormon. And, and I asked him, so, so what do you see in the Book of Mormon when you read it? And he said, the Book of Mormon has a lot of emphasis on spiritual gifts. Of course, this is a Pentecostal tradition. Then he says, in the early 19th century, not that many people were talking about spiritual gifts. And he says, that's really interesting to me, that the Book of Mormon, at that point, was putting some emphasis on that in, in ways that are sort of distinctive from what else was going on in, in, in American religion at the time. Now, that's something that would have never occurred to me. It speaks about very big, broad questions that go much further uh, than, than the 19th century. There's a reason it's still relevant and still speaks to us. I really appreciate that the Maxwell Institute is trying to publish models for us. Um, that we can grow together as a community with that. Um, I also appreciate that their um, journals are focusing on the way that Mormons read scriptures in particular ways, um, and I think that contributes to the larger scholarly discussion um, where there are journals that focus on sort of Catholic readings or particular Protestant readings that this kind of adds to that mix. Um, and I, I hope as time goes on that more scholars are outside of our community will get to know them and will want to kind of look up. So what, what would Mormons say about this particular verse? Um, I, I know what you know, this Catholic theologian says or that Protestant theologian says, but what might a Mormon reader think of that? And that kind of become a larger religious, part of the religious conversation in the discipline. Conjointly. Uh, so the Christians have studied Christians, the Jews have studied Jews, the Muslims have studied Muslims, or scholars of Islam have studied Islam but paying no attention to, say, a Christian author or a Jewish author who lived in the same place at the same time talking about the same things. So only relatively recently are uh, scholars beginning to try to cross the, these uh, confessional divides. I mean, it's really sort of strange that in a secular age, the confessional divides are still determining the, uh, the academic agenda, you know? The Center for the Preservation of Ancient Religious Texts rescues priceless documents from the ravages of time by digitizing them and making them available to researchers and students of ancient religion. In addition to preservation, CPART also produces original research based on these ancient religious texts. All our work serves to preserve and share part of the world's rich religious heritage. The work of the Center, the work of the Center for Preservation of Ancient Religious Texts is not to to do conservation work. We don't preserve ancient texts by uh, going out into monasteries and, and, and doing the work of conserving documents so that they don't deteriorate anymore. We preserve through dissemination, and we do our dissemination digitally. We use books, but uh, books are often outdated, 
and uh, for purposes of searching, of examining, of uh, identifying fragments, you really need the help of a computer. When CPART began in 1996, we were on the kind of cutting edge of building software to do databases using specialist imaging technology. In some ways, it's kind of the culmination of what's going on in the humanities, where you see a turn to the digital, which is giving us much more data to work with, basically. But not only just in digital form, but also with parsed data. That is, you could just search for a word and find all the times that this word occurs. This is something that 15 years ago would have been absolutely unthinkable. I think CPART's capitalized on this and done a very responsible job with it, and it's giving us real tools, so it's not kind of an abstract principle. The uh, real novelty was uh, the link between those texts and images. And at BYU, they did an excellent job. They brought their expertise. It provided uh, some work opportunity for some of our students. But that was incidental. The real value, as far as, as we are concerned, uh, is making the materials available uh, to a much wider audience. And that's something that we would never have had the means or the expertise to, to do ourselves. And, and that is what got us, into, got us into a number of projects, but also ended up getting us into the Vatican Library. The Vatican Library is it's a very important part of for Syriac studies. It's essential for the research because one of the interesting features of Syriac studies is that a number of Syriac texts still remain only in manuscript form. So it's not like Greek or Latin where you can just go pick up an edition on the library shelves. Some of the most important texts that we have are still existing only in manuscripts. To me, it's not only a question of, oh, isn't that interesting that in the ninth century this happened, but that there's something in all that of a gift to us now to help enliven our faith in a different time with different challenges. The broad context is, for me, is this sort of search for friends in common and finding, and, and if I can find a friend in the fourth century in, in ancient Southeast Turkey or Northern Syria or in the fifth century in the same place, then I, that's a good thing. I, I, I feel that sense of kindredness for those of us who treasure the life of the mind and scholarship, this is just a rigorous, systematic way to be a seeker. That's what it is. That's who we are. For a disciple of Jesus Christ, academic scholarship is a form of worship. For the disciple scholar, the first and second great commandments frame and prioritize life. How else could one worship God with all of one's heart, might, mind, and strength? Elder Neil A. Maxwell. I always go back to, to the things that Elder Maxwell said. He would say things like, um, unasserted convictions are deserted convictions. If I can help people understand the scriptures better, and through their reading and understanding of the scriptures can hopefully help them be better church members, then maybe I'm fulfilling that mission. So I think this is an age when we act, connect with more confidence and pr propound positive, good things that we can do with our immense resources rather than uh, just battling off the enemy. As the church has continued to progress and grow in terms of number and numbers and influence, there's a growing segment of those in between who really aren't necessarily out to attack us. They're not necessarily out to defend us. They just want to understand us. And that presents a wonderful opportunity, and I think an area in which we can provide not only help to them, but to also members of the church who themselves have questions as they sort of encounter things that don't necessarily fit into this black and white world. That's one of the primary functions of the Maxwell Institute that it's not only positioned to do, but charged with doing. We're seeing our mission is to bless the world in every way. And that means to join forces with good people everywhere in advancing righteous causes. As disciples, we bring charity, a Christ-like love for the, for the ancient authors that we are publishing and for the communities 
that those ancient authors are still important to today. I actually feel the spirit when I read scholarship. I'm one of those few people who has read every word of the six volumes of Royal Skousen's uh, analysis of textual variants of the Book of Mormon. And when I read those discussions about should it have been, you know, there or the, I actually feel the spirit because there's something that comes through that says every word matters. This is a gift from God. It's revelation. And, and taking it seriously in that sort of way is, for me, an act of faith. Joseph Smith taught us that truth is truth, no matter where it comes from, no matter where it's found, and that the gospel of Jesus Christ is prepared to embrace all truth, no matter where it comes from. Joseph Smith was fearless in his quest for truth. We should cultivate that same courage of being willing to embrace truth wherever we find it, beauty wherever we find it, even if it's something very different than what we're used to and what we were brought up with. I'm struck by the language of the closing chapter of the Book of Mormon, that to come unto Christ is to love God with all our mind. Latter-day Saint scholars care about language like that, and we think about it. What would that mean? What does that look like to love God with all our mind? And certainly it, it, it demands our best effort, our, our highest priority, our, our best work. It's never a question of either or. Do we go with reason or do we go with faith? With Joseph Smith, it was always we find a way to reconcile both. Uh, my favorite photograph in all of church history is the photograph of Orson Pratt's observatory, which he builds right up. It abuts the, the, the rising Salt Lake Temple. And so you've got the temple in the background, in the foreground, you have this adobe mud hut with a telescope. It's the temple and the observatory. It's, it's, uh, we can find a way to combine both of these uh, approaches to learning and, uh, and, and build a kingdom in that, along that model. And I think the Maxwell Institute represents an opportunity not to escape those tensions, not to hide our head uh, in the face of that paradox and to embrace that sometimes it's the very tensions, very counterpoints that have this expanding force um, that as we are encountering um, the tensions between our scholarly discoveries and our faith commitments, uh, that actually through that process we are enlarged. Our Savior was uh, the ultimate exemplar of that um, in that he personally took upon himself the weight of justice and mercy, the ultimate paradox, the ultimate tension. And it cost him everything to do that on our behalf. But in our small, broken, imperfect ways, I think we have the opportunity to follow that example in a willingness to shoulder the paradoxes of faith and scholarship. Um, and that sometimes comes at a high price for us as well. But it's a price that in the spirit of our Savior's ultimate sacrifice, I think we need to be willing to make um, to, to shoulder whatever burdens and difficulties come along uh, with the effort to hold on to both faith and learning.